Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to be discussing the Wells criteria for deep vein thromboses, or DVTs. Now understand that there's also a separate different Wells criteria for pulmonary embolisms, and so if you're dealing with those, you're going to have to look up a separate table. This one is specific for DVTs, so let's actually dive right into it. So in this table on the left side, we have 10 different clinical characteristics. On the right side, each one of those is assigned an individual score. The first nine of these all have an individual score of plus one. Only the last one, alternative diagnosis at least, as likely as a DVT, is a negative two. So the 10 clinical characteristics are, number one, active cancer. Cancer has a strong link with the development of DVTs. Paralysis, paresis, or recent plaster immobilization of the lower extremities. DVTs tend to form in the deep veins of the legs. And so if that leg has been immobilized and hasn't been moving around, you're likely to have the formation of a DVT. Number three here is recently being bedridden for three days or major surgery within the last 12 weeks. Now, in acute care nowadays... People are not bedridden. We don't just confine people to bed rest. That's been proven to be bad. For this reason, DVTs and potential pulmonary embolisms that could result. Uh, but after major surgeries, let's be honest, most people are not going to be as active as they were initially. And depending on how bad the surgery is, uh, people can be less active for longer periods of time. In general, immobility puts you at risk for a DVT, uh, just like number two here. Okay? Number four is localized tenderness along the deep venous system. This is something that can be palpated by the clinician, and it will be felt by the patient. The most common place for someone with a DVT to feel pain in this area is on the back side of the lower leg, so on the calf, on the proximal part, so just distal to the knee. So if you feel just distal to your knee, that area, that's the most common place where people will feel pain with a deep vein thrombosis. Number five here is the entire leg being swollen. So if somebody has a DVT, that's occluding blood flow. And veins bring blood in the direction from the foot back up to the heart, right? So if you occlude blood flow somewhere in the lower extremity in the vein, then you're going to see swelling distal to the occlusion. So if you have an occlusion in the popliteal vein, right, then you're going to see swelling distal to the popliteal vein. So basically distal to the knee. And so what you might see is something like this. So here on the person's right lower leg, uh, it's clearly more red than you see on the left. Okay, It's probably also going to be warm, particularly more distally because blood is warm. And as we just mentioned, they're also going to have pain, usually on the back side, about right here on the proximal part of the calf. And then also, there's of course swelling. And on the lines of swelling, number six here, uh, we might expect that this calf right here on the right is going to have a circumference that is more than three centimeters greater than what we see on the left. And if their circumference here is, let's say, five centimeters greater, uh, then the person's going to get a point for the calf swelling. Uh, number seven here, they may also have pitting edema um, confined to the symptomatic leg. So in this case, there might be pitting edema on the right, but we would not expect to see that on the left. You might also see number eight here, collateral superficial veins. So there's a superficial vein, it's the darker blue kind of going right here okay, in the picture. But these ones that look a little like purpley, the smaller thin ones, those are the collateral superficial veins. This occurs when there's a blockage, and if you're blocking venous flow, then the blood has to find another way back to the heart, right? So the veins will start sprouting these small collateral branches, which basically just provide almost like an anastomosis to connect the blocked vein to maybe another vein that's not as blocked. Anything to get blood back to the heart. If you see this, this is a point on the Wells criteria. Also, a previously documented DVT. If you've already had a DVT, uh, it means that you're susceptible to forming them. And so that also rules up the fact that you might have a DVT. All those, one through nine that we just talked about, each one that a patient has gives them an additional one point. However, this last one, alternative diagnosis, at least as likely as DVT, 
that gives you a score of minus two. So that actually helps to rule down a DVT. Well, if there's another diagnosis that explains the patient's issues, then it rules down the fact that you might have a DVT. So this one gets a negative two for the score. And so what you do is if you suspect that a patient might have a deep vein thrombosis, you screen them for all 10 of these characteristics. And for each one that they have, you add on the individual score. And at the end, you basically add up all the scores to get a total score, and then you come down here and look at the clinical probability of a DVT. So for example, if you have a patient that has active cancer and their entire leg, let's say their left leg is swollen, and that left leg has a four centimeter larger circumference than the right side or the asymptomatic side, and that's all that they have, well, they have three clinical characteristics here, right? Active cancer, uh, leg swelling, that is entire leg swelling, and then the symptomatic leg is more than three centimeters larger than the asymptomatic side. Okay, so they have one, two, three. Basically, they have a score of three. Once you have your total score here, you basically come down here and look at the clinical probability of a DVT. So the rule is, is that if the total score is less than two, so basically one, zero, or negative, a DVT is unlikely. But if the score is two or more, so two, three, four, and so on, a DVT is likely. Okay, so let's now take a look at some other tests that we can run to help further rule up or rule down the likelihood of a DVT. And I apologize, there was actually an error on this figure. So that's what these things are right here. They'll go away in just a second. So now let's look at some of those tests that allow us to rule up or rule down a DVT. So we have our Wells score, right? And we said that if the score is less than two, so one, zero, or negative, it's a low risk of a DVT, so the DVT is unlikely. However, it's important to know that even if the score is one, uh, that doesn't mean that the risk of a DVT is zero. It could be hiding in there, and maybe some of these things just don't present in that patient. Okay, So you might have what's called a D-dimer test ordered to confirm or refute a DVT. So what is a D-dimer test? Well, we have to understand what a D-dimer is, okay? So we have cross-linked fibrin. What is fibrin? Fibrin is the main constituent of a blood clot. And what is a DVT? It is a blood clot, just in the deep veins. And so anytime you have cross-linked fibrin, there's always some level of plasmin that's activated. Okay, remember that plasmin is an enzyme that's normally in the body that cuts up fibrin and breaks it down. And so the more cross-linked fibrin you have, the more D-dimers you're gonna have. And that's because uh, whenever plasmin, this enzyme, acts on cross-linked fibrin, one of the products that you get is a D-dimer. If you look down here, cross-linked fibrin initially will just be degraded to what are called fibrin degradation products, but then some of those can be degraded further into the D-dimer. And so if your D-dimer test is high, that could mean that you have a blood clot somewhere in your body, right? Because of the cross-linked fibrin. And one of the sources of those blood clots is the DVT. So you order a D-dimer test to help rule up or rule down a DVT. If the D-dimer test is less than 0.5, it's a negative test, meaning that the person probably does not have a deep vein thrombosis. But if the D-dimer test is positive, meaning that the value is at least 0.5, so 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, then it probably means that the person does have a DVT and you should treat them as such. And two of the treatments that are commonly used are anticoagulants and also compression wraps for the lower extremity, usually used in conjunction with each other. Now let's assume we're dealing with a Wells score of at least two, so two through nine nine being the highest score that you can attain on this test. Now, this high right here, it really could say moderate slash high. Remember, moderate risk would be between two and six, and high risk would be greater than six, so seven, eight, or nine. Really, if somebody has a score of seven through nine, you don't need to do any of this. You just assume that the person has a deep vein thrombosis and treat as such. Compression wraps for the lower extremity, and anticoagulants. But if the person has a score between two or six, particularly on the low end between two and four, you probably want to rule that up or rule it out with proximal ultrasound. 
So what is proximal ultrasound? To answer that question, let's do a little bit of review. Suppose I have a DVT here in the popliteal vein, right there where my mouse is. What does that mean for the blood content proximal to that in the femoral vein and distal to that here in the lower leg? Well, proximal to the popliteal vein right here where the occlusion is, I'm not gonna have a lot of blood flow, right? Because I'm blocking blood flow past this point up. So the femoral vein right here is gonna be relatively drained. However, distal to the popliteal vein, all of this is going to be backed up and swollen. Okay, That's why when you have a DVT, it's the distal part of the lower extremity that's swollen. And above this, probably above the knee, so in the femoral vein area, it's actually going to be relatively drained. And so what they'll do is they'll order an ultrasound of the venous system proximal to where they think the occlusion is. So if they think the occlusion is near the popliteal vein, they'll order a proximal ultrasound near the femoral vein, this area up here. And so here's the ultrasound image right here. Um, this black structure right here where I'm outlining, this is basically the outline of some of the deep veins. Exactly which ones is not important right now. Notice that it's a pretty large black space right here, and that indicates that they're full of blood, right? If they're full of blood, they're gonna be more distended. But over here on the right side, this is actually somebody that might have a DVT. Notice that this black space right here is actually relatively small compared to what we have on the normal side here on the left. And so if you ordered a proximal ultrasound and this is what you got, that's sort of like a positive test. And so that would actually rule up a DVT. So in the case of a moderate or high risk of a DVT based on a Wells score, you order a proximal ultrasound. If it's negative, meaning what you see over here on the left, then you might repeat the ultrasound in six to eight days. However, it does strongly rule down a current DVT. However, if it's positive, like you see over here, with not much space there in veins because they're not distended, there's not any blood in them, right? Uh, then you assume the person has a DVT and treat as such, compression wraps, anticoagulants, whatever you need to break up that DVT. Hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the Wells criteria for a DVT. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.